This is You've Already Been Hacked, recorded on 27 November 2021. Well, here we are, almost in December. I hope everyone in the United States had a wonderful Thanksgiving, had lots of tryptophan, a little bit of the sleepies, did whatever you had to do with your family and all that type of good stuff, and everybody's doing okay. A small update on the home lab. I keep trying to figure out exactly where I want to start the podcast for that. Um, I have collected all the parts, uh, the shelving, all of that sort of stuff. Um... So I'm getting the pieces all together. Um, I think once I actually start the build is when when we'll start recording for uh, the podcast. That way there's something more complete. Uh, We're going from very big old hardware to very, very tiny new hardware. I think it'll be interesting. Uh, Ultimately, uh, the one main thing I am concerned with with the home lab, and if you have any suggestions, get back with me and let me know, is heat exhaust and and placement. Um, Obviously, this is going to be somewhere inside of the house. I'm just not sure where I want to put it, and I certainly don't want my home office to become a hotbox. So... Uh, just trying to run run ideas and options and figure out, uh, you know, over-engineer my solution so that it's not that much of a problem and so that something Mrs. Cyber Risk will actually tolerate inside the home. Uh, with that, on to the news. A friend of mine alerted me to this story, and uh, I think it's going to be... I have, I have mixed feelings about it, but I think it's an important thing nonetheless. So, uh, new rules have been issued by the FDIC for banks to report breaches. Under a new cybersecurity incident notification rule, banks in the United States will be required to notify federal regulators of any cybersecurity incidents within 36 hours of discovering it. The rule takes effect April 1st, 2022, although enforcement will not begin until May. So they have a 30-day grace period to try and get used to the idea of doing it. One, 30 days probably long enough considering the rampantness of cyber breaches we've seen great uh but i have other opinions we'll get to uh throughout the story um so moving on uh this came out of the uh, board of governors uh system and office of the comptroller uh for currency meeting announced this uh final version of the computer security incident notification requirements for banking organizations and their bank service providers on the 18th of November. So any FDIC uh, supervised financial organization will need to contact their FDIC designated point of contact via any means necessary, right? Email, telephone, similar methods, quote unquote, as soon as possible and no later than 36 hours after the organization has determined that a security incident, uh, quote, that rises to the level of a notification incident, unquote, has been occurred. Uh, bank services, service providers will also be required to report incidents to banks in case of incidents where banking services are disrupted for more than four hours. Okay, so what are security incidents under this rule? Well, it refers to any event that results uh, in actual harm to confidentiality, integrity, or availability, standard cybersecurity CIA of information systems. Notification incidents, however, are events that cause serious disruption to operations or prevent the bank from delivering its uh, services and products or uh, events that pose risk to the financial sector's stability. An example of this is computer failure. Could happen because of a cybersecurity incident or just hardware blows up by itself, because we all know if that happens. Uh, Stability in Windows and Linux sometimes can be a thing. Or, say, a DDoS, ransomware event, etc. Now, there's been some existing guidance uh, that has been out there. What, What changes here is that customer data doesn't have to be directly impacted or exposed because of this event. Now, now, if it ha if any of these types of things happens, they're still supposed to report in. That's a probably a net positive. In the notification within that 36 hour period, the banks are not required 
to provide any sort of assessment or analysis or anything else. They just have to say, hey, we've had a problem, right? They just need to notify. Uh, the other regulations banks have to go through, which is suspicious activity reports, et cetera. All of that stuff still has to happen. So nothing there is changing. That's good. My overall opinion of this is great that we have this regulation or this rule, excuse me, now in place. I hope that uh, all banks, uh, financial institutions that, that are subject to this rule in the U.S. actually follow it. And I do mean that with a big H hope. Um, most businesses would rather not report such things. Uh, and the fact that there's this gray space of when they know, well, what does when they know mean? Who has to know? Is it just the IT staff when they know? Is it the CEO? I mean, depending on the interpretation of the rule, when they know could be a very wide gamut from from initially suspected to confirmed to reported up to the boss or the CIO or the CISO or whoever is responsible for talking to the point of contact and then actually informing the point of contact, right? So there could be a massive delay here depending on the scruples of said institution. Concerned about that? Uh, we'll see how this actually plays out. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's a good thing. Uh, TBD. Now, just to uh, hone in on my last point there, financial sector, critical infrastructure, right? Healthcare, we've talked about before, is also critical infrastructure. Well, some healthcare entities delayed patient breach notifications by an exceedingly long period of time. All covered entities and relevant businesses associates are required to inform patient breaches to their protected health information within 60 days and without delay to comply with the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, regardless of whether an investigation into a hack, data theft, or other security incident is ongoing. Right? Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Uh, throughout this past year, though, the timeliness requirement has been one of the most commonly overlooked compliance areas with an average uh, of an ever-increasing list of providers failing to adhere to the rule. And there, there are plenty of examples. Here are just a few. CMAR had reported a massive uh, patient data theft five months after discovery. That's three months longer than they had to do it. The personal uh, and health data of almost 700,000 CMAR Community Health Center patients was accessed, Ill exfiltrated, and leaked online after a month long system hack that began in December 2020, according to breach notifications posted on the provider's website. CMAR is a nonprofit entity serving underserved patients in Washington. So it looks like data was, just in this example, it looks like data was taken uh, sometime between December 2020 and March 2021. And that was before it was discovered. CMAR then sought out information for impacted patients all the way through, apparently, 30 August of 2021. And notices were finally sent out on the 29th of October. That's 10 months after the potential for the initial hack. That's a little over the HIPAA requirement. Another example of a, um, another large medical facility, Lake Bone and Joint reported a Microsoft Office 365 hack. Uh, the hack involved the email platform of Lakeshore Bone and Joint Institute, potentially led to the access of data belonging to almost 24,000 current and former patients and employees. This was first discovered on the 7th of July. A threat actor gained access to their email uh, environment through a single employee email account, so they got fished. Officials said they secured the account and launched an investigation, but the notice does not shed light on the length of the hack, nor whether there was evidence of data access. As the account held patient and employee data, data this is their e email environment, uh, LBJI, uh, is issuing the notice to impact individuals. The compromised data included potentially personal and protected health data, such as names, social security numbers, dates of birth, treatments, diagnoses, provider names, patient IDs, health insurance details, and the cost of treatments. 
the notification went out on November 16th. Uh, they stated that the delayed notification is due to the challenges with finding contact information of those impacted. The Institute has since then taken steps to ensure that that doesn't happen in the future. So with this, it seems like the problem is, hey, we didn't know how to get in touch with the people, so it took us longer to, to actually issue the notification. I don't know about that, and I think I'm going to call a little bit of a red flag. You have patient intake forms. You have their contact information when they come in. You you are supposed to have these medical records. They're supposed to be uh, digital, I believe, at this point, or at least on their way to them. I do not understand why or how these delays occur, except, like I worried about in our first story, companies are only going to notify once they have an absolute reason to notify, whether or not the rules in place state they're supposed to do something different. And the mere fact that critical infrastructure is playing this game with us, uh, I think, has disastrous long-term ramifications. Uh, I hope that the leaders of these critical infrastructure entities change uh, change their mindset and become more transparent. There are some out there that are, and I think that's great. Um, I think we have to be today because the collective good here, uh, it, the risk is too high, and we have to figure out a better way where it is not punitive. The, the main problem is, even if the laws aren't punitive, uh, the social credit, as it were, is very punitive, and we have to change our mindsets on that. If a company is doing everything that it's supposed to do, training, uh, the right type of uh, staff in place, the right type of security in place, the procedures, processes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, we shouldn't hold it against them for getting hacked. And, you know, one thing I've always said in the past is defenders have to be right 100% of the time. An attacker only has to be right once. It is unreasonable for us to expect that our data will be 100% secure all the time. We should demand a high level of security. We should expect them to do everything they can to secure it, but they should be transparent when they fail. And the fact that they're not is why that credit uh, with them, that social credit, and I don't mean the Chinese social credit scores. I mean the... the um, the social credit that we all have in trusting institutions with our data, that's why that is exceptionally low or damaged significantly. They're not honest. They're not clear. They're not transparent. Uh, and because of that, we have great mistrust. And that's something that I think grossly needs to change given the type of uh, pervasive uh, hacking environment that we have here in 2021. And let's uh, let's close out uh, with one more attack on critical infrastructure. Uh, wind turbine manufacturer Vestas Wind Systems shut down its IT uh, just recently after suffering a cyber attack. Vestas is a leading North American manufacturer slash installer and servicing company for wind turbines with over 40,000 megawatts installed and 36,000 plus megawatts under service in the United States and Canada. The company stated that they suffered the attack on Friday, November 19th, forcing them to shut down their IT systems across multiple business units and locations to prevent the attack's spread. As a result of that shutdown, customers, employees, and other stakeholders uh, were likely impacted by the disruption, and some of Vestas' factories were first to, forced to slow down production. Uh, an update that was just recently posted on their website, the firm explained that they were still working on reestablishing the integrity of its IT systems, but they had no timeline for their full recovery. They also confirmed that some data had been compromised, which means that the attackers managed to exfiltrate information from the systems that they were able to gain footholds into. The firm went on to state, though, that their, uh, the impact to their manufacturing, construction, or services was minimal. So it looks like they just lifted data. The firm has not confirmed what type of data had been taken, and they say that the investigation is still ongoing. So it looks like 2021 is the year of the 
critical infrastructure hack, right? This has been going on for a while. It's just becoming far more prominent. Uh, Vestas is an energy provider. So we're going after energy here. We went after the Colonial Pipeline earlier. That's energy. We went after our food production. That's JBS. We are going after the health sector. Critical infrastructure is now the target of choice. It is big money, big opportunity for hackers, and and so much of it is, I dare say, antiquated, although that may be the wrong word. It is not uh, up to date. A lot of it has embedded systems. A lot of it has systems that have known vulnerabilities that are unpatchable just based on configuration of, of that particular network. And, and those things need to be updated or upgraded or hardened in some way. Uh, the challenges for this stuff are, are unfathomable to a degree, will require a lot of effort, a lot of attention, and a lot of money. And whether or not uh, the leadership of these sectors wants to actually pivot there because it's the right thing to do rather than it's something they have to do, uh, we're, we're seeing the results of where we are. They're reactionary. In many instances, they are not proactive. It's something that uh, we should demand change of for all of our safe, uh, safety and, and our collective security, not just in the United States, uh, globally, right? Uh, just because U.S. infrastructure seems to be the target du jour that I talk about, it's also because that's where I sit. Um, I do bring up some of the international hacks and global supply chains being snarled as they are. Uh, something that could take down critical infrastructure could cause a catastrophic rippling effect. Uh, far worse than it would have even two, three years ago. This is something we have to pay attention to. That's all for the news this week. I'm your professor of cyber risk. And we'll talk again soon. If you like this podcast, share it with your colleagues and friends. Your support is how we are able to continue to make this content. Thank you.